we mutate it and we'll try to screen it and see if any of the mutants from this molecule can sense voltage inside of the cells. Uh, library was up to 10 millions. Up 10 millions individual clones. Screening of each cell manually takes several so minutes. So it means I wouldn't be able to finish probably the screening of this library till nowadays if I start doing it manually. Mm -hmm. And Ed uh, was saying, oh, how about we just make robot to do it for us? Mm -hmm. And uh, this is how we end up designing a special robot that uh, can s image very large population of the cells mm -hmm. automatically, pick the best cells expressing the voltage sensing molecule, mm -hmm. uh, and select it using a micro pipette, and everything in a, in automated mode, in fully automated mode. I remember this this day when I s click start. It took me about two years to make it to happen. Mm -hmm. But once it's, everything was set, we click start button. Robot did it for us for two hours while I was drinking coffee. At the end of this process, I take the tube with a few cells selected from the plate. I clone the genes and one of them was the, the Arcon uh, voltage sensor that we're currently using for voltage imaging in vivo. Boom, what's up everyone? Welcome to Simulation. I'm your host, Alan Sakian. We are on site at MIT, Massachusetts Institute of Technology in beautiful Cambridge, Massachusetts. We are now gonna be talking about neural imaging and interfacing. We have Dr. Kirill Piatkevich joining us on the show, hello. Good uh, afternoon. Thank you so much for coming on, really appreciate it. I'm very excited. Also very grateful yeah. to Sir Anoush for introducing yeah. us, Bob Canova, and thank you, huge shout out. For those that don't know Kirill's background, he's a research scientist at MIT Media Lab in the Synthetic Neurobiology Group, focused on advanced neural imaging and interfacing techniques. And you can check out Kirill's links below as well. So check out the work. We're gonna be unpacking a lot of really cool cutting edge stuff. So let's jump into this with one of our favorite questions we like asking. We find ourselves as stewards of Earth. What is your current take on the state of our world? State of our world? I, in everyday life, the most thing I enjoy is our creativity. And I think everybody would enjoy uh, himself a lot more if we can be creative and uncover our potentials in creativity. So like I imagine our world, if ideal world like ancient Greeks when we were doing some of the uh, uh, like early stuff and we were thinking about world without doing much of hard work and let's imagine our robots doing it for us and this is what I would like to achieve so everybody can do whatever we want and be happy and uh, I think this is the most powerful thing we can do in our life be happy be creative and uh, like get this kind of, uh, yeah, like, f to reveal our potential. Yes. And at, at the same time, I would like to be creative and revealing potential in a full harmony with nature. Yes. This is what I imagine, would, this is my perspective, this is what I would like to achieve. And this is why I also study science and study, and I try to, to do research because I want to understand the nature better. Understanding nature better, I would believe that it will allow us to, to live in better harmony with it. Because I'm very concerned, you know, there are lots of stuff going on, uh, climate change, some, and this is a thing we still don't understand very well. And I think everything in the world is connected, and if we understand the world, starting from very small atoms up to an entire universe, with now people putting these images of entire, like not entire, but as much as the Hubble could image, and if we can scale it up and see, okay, this is a harmony, we can understand everything, this would be super cool. And, and, uh, in, and why I say, again, creativity? Because in science, when we do research, creativity, is, I think, is a driving force. Creativity and curiosity is a driving force of our, our uh, like, when we're trying to understand the world, this is, yes. and do research, this is what we, uh, we, we need, first of all, these two things, yeah. Yeah, and I love that so much that the full potential of every single one of these human animals to be able to be as fully actualized into the world 
and to be able to actually have this this tree that every single person is a seed to have that have the roots have the right nutrients so that they can have the best possible fruits and flowers for the civilization is so important and i i, I love that one and and to be able to update the code of our world to make that easier, more effective, to c deploy the next advancements in code for that is so critical. And like you said, with nature, in harmony with nature, so critical. All right, let's go into the journey. So you're a kid and you're growing up in Belarus. Yeah, in a small town, about 10,000 people population. 10,000 people population. Yeah. yeah, see, this is a small town. And then I want to know how you got interested in science. You talk about science as such an important part of, mm -hmm. of, of, of your life and of pushing the edge for, for our world. So how did you get hooked into science at the young age? So the earliest memory of me doing experiments that I have right now, it was probably first grade of elementary school when we found uh, pieces of uh, calcium carbide. And when you put it in the water, it started to release uh, acetylene, the gas that uh, back when we used to uh, solder the pipes. And we were putting it on fire. I really enjoyed it. And, uh, when I get back home, uh, my brother was seven years older than me and he was already studying chemistry. By that time, when I was in elementary school, I found his books on uh, chemistry and physics. And I, was, I started uh, reading. I didn't understand much. I was uh, very fascinating looking on the pictures in the, in the books without understanding much of the text. By uh, fifth grade, I really got into it. And this is when I first time uh, participated in uh, a chemistry olympiad. Oh. It started from a chemistry olympiad, yeah. Nice. And, uh, what I was your project in the chemistry olympiad? Oh, uh, in uh, back when it's uh, in a Soviet Union system, back when it was still a kind of Soviet Union system, it was uh, mostly solving the problems. And you compete with other, uh, with other pupils or mm -hmm. school students to get the highest score to go to the next level, to go to the next level, yeah. And uh, I also was very lucky because my parents were working at, in industry. Mm -hmm. at, uh, my mom was a dairy factory, my dad was at a uh, mechanical factory. Okay. They had an access to the lab. Ah. And I was always, oh, can you take me to your work? Mm -hmm. I want to check out your labs. Yes. And uh, I was asking people from the lab, can I take a little bit of chemical and I can do experiments at home? <laughs> so I had a small home uh, lab uh, for all my middle school. And nice. uh, this is how I got involved. And it, it, it was getting more and more and more every year. Yes. So next summer I said, uh, okay, I don't want to go play to backyard with my friends. I want to... Uh, I want to mix some chemicals and see what's yeah, happening. Yeah. Let's see what happens. Yeah, yeah. See what's happening. Interesting. So that's in that's such a critical part of being young is that when you get the tools and resources that you need to be able to explore what interests you, like being able to have your lab at home and be able to play with it almost every single Although day. my parents didn't like it too much because it not, not always created a good smell, but I tried yeah. to yeah, sneak in and do some experiments, yeah. And then did that interest in chemistry then continue to when you went to Moscow? Is that how you got uh, interested? Yeah, so uh, I was a winner of International Chemistry Olympiad and uh, I the was... The winner? Uh, wow. Okay, silver medal. The silver, silver medal. medal. That's right, still I got silver. Wow. Yeah. And how old were you then? Uh, it was 15. Wow. 15 years old. Good job. Yeah. yeah. And uh, I was uh, during the training at uh, Moscow State University before Olympiad. I talked to a faculty there, and they said, "Oh, if you if you're a winner, we will invite you without any uh, exams." to enroll the Moscow State University Chemistry Department. And back when it was my, my dream to enroll uh, School of Chemistry at Moscow State University because yeah. it was the best school of chemistry back when in the yeah. uh, entire post-Soviet uh, space. Yeah. Yes. Okay, and so, so I the, didn't boom, think about it. Just yeah. like that, you get silver medal, they accept you in for, uh, for, for the chemistry program. Correct. Oh, yeah. sweet, okay. So you, you make the move to Moscow. And you start studying chemistry and you continue this process of 
pushing the edge of science, playing with chemistry. Yeah, I was happy I got an access to a bigger lab <laughs> yeah. with more chemicals <laughs> and with more flask and I started doing experiments. Yeah, I was doing organic chemistry, lots of okay. uh, okay. metal organic chemistry actually, first and second uh, year at uh, college. But uh, I also very quickly realized, okay, this is not very healthy. Unfortunately, we didn't often uh, follow all the safety rules. And I could tell, yeah, I, I feel like, okay, I, I'm sm I smell bad after the lab because we didn't have a proper ventilation. And I decided, oh, maybe I should work a little bit with the safer chemicals. And I, this is how I got a transition into the uh, department of uh, uh, natural compounds, chemistry oh. of natural compounds. Okay. I decided to work with DNA, RNA, and uh, polysaccharides, something that we consist of. Yes. And I decided, okay, this is going to be a little bit safer yeah. for my health. Yeah. yeah, interesting. So some of the initial chemicals, uh, if you're playing in labs that don't have good ventilation systems, we yeah. can end up inhaling those and that cannot be healthy. So that's very important to have very really strong lab safety. But then that got you interested in the life sciences with DNA, RNA. Yeah, yeah, yeah I could okay. do still chemistry, very advanced chemistry, but with the materials that I could not eat, but we definitely require much less safety rules. Yeah. And then what were you doing with DNA, RNA, polysaccharides? What were you doing? Oh, so uh, back when uh, in, uh, in the department, I start working on my uh, diploma work. Mm -hmm. uh, so my, m my interest was in uh, regulation of expression of genes in uh, bacteria. Mm -hmm. uh, we were trying to understand the mechanisms of how bacteria switch over gene expression uh, during different uh, uh, conditions, during transition into different conditions, some awesome. heat shock or yes. some other negative environmental influence, how it does, how fast, and what we can learn about it. So it was yeah. pretty fundamental work on uh, uh, gene uh, regulation. Interesting. So the environment of a bacteria can cause the gene regulation to change quite yeah. sometimes quickly, differently from normal, and you would measure that out and, and log it and then teach Correct. it to people. Yes. Correct. Yes. Interesting. And then that can potentially be used for a lot of our life sciences today in different ways. We can use the uh, gene regulation and expression in uh, tons of different ways potentially for humans and for our world. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and it's it's like a big catalog that's unexplored right now and we have to figure Absolutely. out. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, and then how did from Moscow you go to Bronx in New York City? Cuz that's this is a big move. Yeah, transatlantic. Transatlantic <laughs> move. Yeah. How did that happen? So during uh, how we studied gene expression, we used fluorescent proteins because it's very easy. With fluorescent protein, once you get expressed in bacteria, you can easily visualize bacteria under the microscope. And uh, we had, my department had a connection to the lab at uh, Albert Einstein College of Medicine mm -hmm. that were looking for a graduate student to work on the fluorescent proteins. Cool. So I got an invitation for the grad school and I didn't think much and said, yeah, of course, I would like to continue my work in uh, New York. I got invited, applied for visa, uh, but uh, I, I remember I had like last six hundred dollars in my pocket. I bought the ticket. I have very small luggage, and I flew to New York. I love it. Huge yeah. risk. I love it. You, yeah, I, I was. I, I decided to risk it. Yeah, exactly. And it yeah. also was my dream because back when during my uh, undergrad, I was reading lots of papers. Yeah, my favorite papers, and I saw that all this work is done in the United States. And I wanted to see, oh, is it really so cool? I want to go is and see really? my, so, <laughs> by myself. You know? Is it really so cool? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Ninety percent of work was done in the United States, so I wanted to to get this experience. So I didn't think much, took a ticket and uh, flew it in uh, three days. I think it was like yeah. pretty quick. Okay, and then when you get to Bronx, then you're doing cool things at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine working on the development of novel fluorescent proteins for imaging. For in vivo imaging, yes. Yes, so teach us about what this is like. Uh, so very often uh, in biology, 
what biologists wanna uh, very often they say uh, seeing is believing mm -hmm. if I see I believe yes and uh, in order to see things inside of a cells we need to light them up and uh, in uh, 1978 Osama Shimamura uh, in the bay on the west coast uh, hired a bunch of uh, middle school kids to catch Aquaria Victoria for him in the bay so, and, and uh, bring them to his uh, small laboratory, it was summer laboratory, for dissection and extraction of a special uh, pigment mm -hmm. that later on was used to identify the GFP, green fluorescent protein. Wow. But later on, uh, Martin Chalfi cloned the cDNA and express it in uh, Seligans. So first application for GFP was in Seligans. It was on the cover of Science Journal in 1994. Yeah. And later on, Roger Tien uh, used this cDNA to uh, evolve artificially in a tube, in a PCR tube, evolve all the spectral diversity from blue to yellow. Whoa. 2008, it resulted in a Nobel Prize to three scientists, Sama Shimamura, Roger Tien, and Martin Chalfi. And uh, back when, when I joined the grad school 2007, it was a wave of this development of a new colors, new proteins with the new properties. Uh, it was extremely popular and extremely useful for biologists to put different, to highlight different structures, different molecules inside of our cells, so we can observe it in real time under a microscope. So when now we can see the things and now we can believe it, yeah. But we decided to scale it up and we decided, okay, we don't want to do it in a cell, in a petri dish, we want to do it in a cell, in a whole body, in a, in a living organism. Okay, quick. So we are taking fluorescent proteins from fish. Uh, it's jellyfish and corals. Mostly it's jellyfish and corals. Okay. 90% of them coming from these two. Okay. Hydrozoa and uh, antazoa. Hydrozoa, jellyfish, it's belong to hydrozoa class, corals from antazoa. And so they can express fluorescence. Fluorescent protein. So they can express fluorescence, yes. pro fluorescent protein expression. Correct. Okay, so we took that fluorescent protein ex expression mm -hmm. and we were able to figure out how to express from blue to yellow uh, colors. Yeah. yeah, so we were able to fine tune this proteins to uh, emit the light in this range. Emit the light in this range, yeah. and then then you took that ability and took it in vivo into the cell, and were able to say, I want to tag the mitochondria. For example, uh, anything, and, we could do anything. And then you could look under the microscope and see the fluorescent, the mitochondria lit under the cell. Uh, absolutely, yes. That's beautiful. Yeah. Yes, yes. And we could do it in many different colors. We can resolve many different colors and we can uh, do multiplexing. Do multiple things simultaneously. Okay, because you could do uh, blue for a specific ribosome and yellow for the mitochondria. For and example, then, yeah. Uh, oh, wow, yeah, that's so cool. And, uh, but when we decided to do it in uh, vivo. How does it know, wait, how does, how do you, how does it know to go to the ribosome or the mitochondria, how do you? Ah, right. So, <laughs> nature is very smart. Everything is very, very regulated. Nature uh, follows very well, uh, uh, follows the rules. And uh, we can uh, understand these rules and use them uh, for uh, our purposes to study. And in order to send the protein to mitochondria, we append it with a small sequence. Once the sequence is in a cell floating in cytoplasm, it gets recognized by cellular machinery mm -hmm. and get exported to mitochondria. It's like uh, signaling sequences. Okay, so you add a signaling sequence to the protein, and mm -hmm. then and then the cell will say, "Okay, and let's go to this area." And the dip depending on the s signal that you add to the protein, it will tell it to go to a different part of Correct. the cell. So people figure out many different ways to highlight different different structures, Sing single molecules or some other subcellular structures. Yes. Okay. Okay. Cool. Cool. All right. So then, that 
going to from in vivo you started saying that you wanted to take that into human uh, or at least animal yes to to uh, whole organisms yes and uh, what's happening with the whole organisms that uh, the shorter wavelengths of the light the harder it is to catch its emission so if you ever put your hand on a on a lamp mm -hmm. you see you saw red Yes. Did you? Yes, yes, yes. It's not because of blood you have in your hand. Yes, yes. But because the hand is like a filter, uh -huh. it's filter all the wavelengths except the red one. So red gets through and you see Interesting. You see red. So, and uh, what does it mean? It means that the red color or red light is the light with the biggest L penetration. Long enough Correct. wavelength to be able to get through our Correct. cells. Yes. Our tissue. Our, our tissue. Our clay, yes. Interesting, but blue and purple cannot. No. Yellow, green, no. Blue, no. Uh, so they have much uh, shorter uh, distance, so they absorb more and they scatter more. It's a, it's a factor of two. It's scattering and absorption. Oh, interesting. Okay. okay. So, and as a result, the, my major goal was to make fluorescent proteins with a long enough emission spectrum so we can do a whole body imaging in uh, of uh, small animals like back when I was working with mouse mostly and how did that go uh, it wasn't very it didn't work very well in the beginning so we were trying to push GFP and other proteins that we found in corals to a spectrum up to 700 nanometers. So this yeah. is the edge of what our eye can see. Yes, yes. Uh, beyond 700 is getting the spectrum for eye getting very difficult to recognize. And uh, again, we got a hint from uh, Roger Tien. In 2009, he, publishes, uh, he published paper in Science on using bacterial phytochromes. This time, we found different type of organism in a soil bacteria they use red light to regulate their uh, cycle. And why I was surprised, why red light in a soil bacteria? Because this is the only light that can get through a door with bacteria living in to get them activated. And this protein is called bacterial phytochromes. And uh, I was surprised, they're pretty abandoned. And this uh, protein had a completely different uh, chromophore that could bring us beyond 700 nanometers. I think the most redshifted uh, fluorescent protein right now from bacterial phytochromes is 720 nanometers. Mm -hmm. So you need night vision goggles to, if you want to see it with your eyes. Mm -hmm. So this is, this is my, this is how I, uh, uh, the goal was, can we push it to in vivo? We tried and failed with uh, fluorescent protein from jellyfish and corals, and we were able to make it to work in uh, corals. Oh, in, uh, from bacteria phytochromes, from bacteria, yeah. Okay. And then how did you then go from the Albert Einstein College of Medicine to Cambridge? Uh, the major uh, application that I was working for with fluorescent proteins for in vivo imaging was uh, cancer research. Mm -hmm. And I think it's very important research and uh, can be very, very impactful. Potentially I, lighting up the cancer cells. To see how they get through the tumor to the bloodstream and from bloodstream to the lungs. So oh. we, our goal was to trace metastasis of the cells. Wow. Because why people dying from uh, uh, cancer, it's most often because of uh, our lung, like lungs getting clumped with uh, lots of uh, cells from a tumor, from a uh, metastasis. We're, we're getting into lungs, start propagating, and people suffocating. So this is was the major uh, thing. If we could stop metastasis, it means we can at least slow down the the cancer in the people. And our goal was to develop the methods that could allow us to visualize how the single cells from a tumor site go into the lungs and the whole body. In this case, using this kind of model organism, we will be able to, treat, we will be able to find treatment as fast as possible 
we, for example, given a, some drugs to a mouse and see if we can stop or reduce the speed of this metastasis. Uh, and during my uh, uh, PhD work, I was reading a lot about other types of uh, light sensitive molecules. And one molecule that fascinated me a lot was chanorodopsin 2. It was published in 2005 in, uh, in Journal of Neuroscience. And uh, it was shown that expression of chanorodopsin 2 molecule, it's a wild type molecule from uh, another algae, it's a unicellular algae, mm -hmm. can uh, allow us to uh, activate neuronal activity with a single spike precision. Whoa. And this gave us enormous, enormous application for uh, neuroscience in order to, for example, to crack the neuronal code. It would be very, very useful using light to either activate or silence neuronal activity. This is something that uh, was predicted or not predicted, but something that was anticipated in 1978 when um, I think Crick said uh, one of the uh, people who got Nobel Prize for DNA structure. He said it would be very, very useful to have a tool that would allow us uh, optical control neuronal activity in vivo. And this has happened in 2005. I was extremely fascinated by chanorodopsin. And the first uh, author on this paper at the same day when I was reading about ch ch chanorodopsin was in our uh, uh, at Albert Einstein College of Medicine giving a lecture. Mm. It was at Boyden. Mm. And uh, I uh, attended his lecture and I decided, okay, this is, he's doing great research. I want to be part of his team advancing uh, new optogenetic uh, tools for neuroscience. I emailed him uh, right away. I, I even remember this first time, less than five minutes he shoot me back, oh, do you want to stop by my lab and uh, we can chat about it more? And I said, of course, uh, we, we take in the car, I'm, I'm driving uh, up to Cambridge. Mm -hmm. <laughs> when I met him, I proposed him uh, some research and he told me, why don't you come over and work for me? I said, no problem. And uh, yeah, and, and Ed gave me the postdoc position right away. I was wow. very, very happy. I joined it in uh, 2013. Wow, wow. Okay, but then from, you, that was 2006 was the paper, and 2013 is when you joined the team. Yeah, so uh, it was uh, several years, not so many people believed in uh, optogenetics. optogenetics. interesting. Yes. And uh, it was in 2015, it was uh, 10 years of optogenetics, and uh, I think Nature Neuroscience published a small uh, article about uh, quotes of different people. And you can see that 50% of the people think, oh, it's cool, but it's not going to go anywhere. You know? and, uh, t but 2010, it was uh, methods of a year, I think, 2010. So it was very, ra very, ra very rapid. And uh, I was already on a wave when people realized, okay, this is, this is going to be very huge. By that time, it was very, very huge, yes. Okay. And I wanted to be part of it. I wanted to make it even bigger. Further. Interesting. So, yeah, optogenetics for neuromodulation, for either exciting or inhibiting cells. neuronal Correct. cells. All right. Now, I'm interested to know what you came in with the proposals. You said that, <laughs> yeah, Ed was like, yes, come on and yeah. join the synthetic neurobiology uh, group as yeah, a postdoc. Correct. Yeah, uh, what were the proposals? Very, when, when I talked to Ed for the first time, I uh, very quickly understood he's a very big th thinker. He thinks very, very big. And uh, I decided in order to impress him, I also got to think big. Uh, I was very interested in, uh, it was also a time of a singularity talks, people were talking about singularity. And I was thinking about cyborgs that would combine artificial, uh, some part of uh, uh, pro probably uh, silicon hardware and carbon hardware, our, our brains. And, uh, we knew that it's very difficult to combine these two together mm -hmm. materials. Uh, especially if we insert the electrodes into the brain, we get immune response, uh, yes. cells die around the electrode. It doesn't save for too long. But if we interact with silicon life and carbon life interact through the light, it's much safer. Ah. And what can give us uh, the, uh, the ability to interact with light is uh, 
of the genetic tools. Yeah. We can both transmit information to the neurons, excite them, or inhibit them. At the same time, we can read out this information by light. Okay, let me give a quick example for maybe something that's very relatable. So something that we can consider even optogenetic is how we take in visual information all the time. Absolutely. So, we're, yeah. so as we take in stimuli of light reflecting off of chairs and tables mm -hmm. and all that stuff, we are modulating neurons. And so that is optogenetic in that sense. Uh, and molecules in our retina, rhodopsins, responsible for interacting with the light, that are very similar uh, to optogenetic tools uh, that we're currently using. Yes, it's a uh, type 1 rhodopsins from uh, algae, for, or they call also my microbial opsins for algae and bacteria and fungi. And uh, we have type 2. Uh, rhodopsins is one of the example in our uh, in our uh, uh, eyes. Yes. Rhodopsin. Rhodopsin. Yes. Rhodopsin. Interesting. So it's very similar mechanism. We get excited in our eye and we uh, generating certain signals. And you wanted to make it easier for silicon to interface with the carbon in Correct. us through optogenetics. So Correct. would this be somehow? Uh, through the optical uh, uh, modulating light and then that modulating neurons? Uh, no, back when I was thinking that we will have to deliver uh, opsins into our neurons and get some uh, optical, uh, some uh, kind of uh, illumination devices and camera around our skull. For humans, this is how I imagine. So we we can talk through the, through the skull using light. We excite and we collect the light through the skull. Although, but we will have to genetically modify our neurons, go and express something. So this is something FDA still doesn't approve. Can <laughs> you go uh, from outside the cranium can, f with light? So red light can go through. Interesting. Not far, but it can, for mouse we were able to do it yes. with red light. Red light. So wow. Uh, we now can do non-invasive, uh, for example, calcium imaging using near infrared uh, sensors. Yeah. Through the skin and through the skull. Interesting. Although resolution is dropping, it's not yeah. a single cell resolution, but we can do non-invasive. Yeah, yeah, not single cell, but although non -invasive. not single due to the too much scattering, but yes, yeah, non-invasive. Yeah. Interesting. Wow. So okay. this is my idea, and I said this is a great idea. It's not going to work right now. This is not the right time <laughs> for this idea, <laughs> but uh, come and, and come work with us. Okay, so then that was kind of your uh, 2013 getting into optogenetics, studying mm -hmm. that, also studying expansion microscopy, being able to expand the tissue. Uh, actually, back when, when I just joined the group, expansion microscopy didn't exist. By the way. What was that, 2015? So uh, it was published at the end of 2014. Okay. When I joined the lab, uh, uh, Paul and Faye and I think Ishan, they already had an idea. Oh, we want to make things bigger mm -hmm. in order to get a better resolution of a small features inside. But uh, back when it, I think even the term expansion microscopy wasn't yet invented. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, it was very, very rapid development because uh, they very quickly figure out how to expand the biological samples uh, isotropically, yes. preserving some labels that we could uh, see uh, under microscope. And you preserve the shape of the tissue as the it would expand. Yes, yes. That's so critical. And then be able to do things like have the fluorescent proteins as well. Yes. Yeah. So, and uh, this is where uh, my expertise helped a little bit when we brainstormed with Fay. Uh, he told me, oh, I can anchor uh, proteins right now into a gel. Uh, and I told him we need to do it with the GFP because GFP sh is robust enough to survive uh, expansion, mm -hmm. digestion and expansion. And uh, I remember I gave him samples with the fluorescent proteins in cells. He expanded and it worked out beautifully from a first attempt. We never repeat this experiment. It worked out and we say, okay, we gotta, we gotta hurry up and, and publish it, yeah. 
Oh, it's so cool. Yeah. So that, that is actually a big testament to when you put together the uh, multidisciplinary thinking uh, uh, where you come with the expertise of fluorescent proteins, uh, with the expertise of pushing expansion microscopy, and you're like, hey, Correct. add this. Yeah, that's so yeah, cool. It was a unique environment. It's still a very unique environment when uh, so many different people with very different background and expertise working together and talking on a daily basis. This is when brainstorming happening on, yeah, all the time. And this is when we're getting new ideas, new crazy ideas to try out. <laughs> yeah. People, I, I enjoy, I'm enjoying it a lot. I think this is very unique. This is very unique. It's super unique. The two words that I think have been uh, a major part of my understanding of, of synthetic neurobiology uh, most recently has been optogenetics and expansion, expansion micro microscopy. Yeah. And I think even expansion microscopy recently start, start to take over even more. <laughs> Yeah, I know I, I've been uh, participating in several conferences and people, uh, when we talk to me, ah, I'm saying, oh, I'm in Ed Boyd's lab. And he's, oh, expansion microscopy lab. <laughs> <laughs> Not so many people <laughs> even recognize right now what optogenetics is. Yeah, yeah. yeah, expansion microscopy. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That's so great. And all right. And now I want you to take us into these um, novel tools and methods for mm -hmm. neural imaging and interfacing. The ones that, um, especially like, you know, the ones that you worked on, you said about four years of the time from 2013, 2019, six mm -hmm. years, but you worked four years specifically on optical voltage sensors. Correct. Yeah, yes. so yeah. So teach us about what that that is. It's a robotic multi-dimensional directed evolution approach yeah. applied to fluorescent voltage reporters. So when I proposed this idea of interfacing brain with a machine using light, we had perfect epigenetic tools so we can communicate information to the neurons. But back then we didn't have any tools that can communicate information from the neurons back to the machine. Yeah. This is one of the reasons why I said, okay, this is not the right time. We don't still have all the tool set for, for this kind of approach. And we were missing the molecule that would convert to light, or that would convert voltage of the neurons back to the light. Mm -hmm. So now optogenetic convert to light into a voltage. We mm -hmm. need something voltage back into the light. Yes. And that proposed, oh, how, how about you, you develop a voltage sensor that can be compatible with optogenetic control mm. and can report uh, voltage with a sub-threshold uh, precision at a biologically relevant time scale. Because neurons are the fastest uh, cells in terms of their changing their membrane potential. This is how we communicate. Like we, millisecond. Even microseconds, yeah. We're sending very short uh, electrical pulses along the neurons Mm -hmm. along with axons, axons, and this is how we communicate. So yeah. if we want to understand the neurons, we need to record the action potentials. We need to record the voltage across the plasma membrane. So we're talking right now, while you and I are talking, we have billions of neurons that are firing. And talking to each and other. And talking to each other. To Although we don't see it. We, we don't, don't see, see it. it. Yeah. And As we a, barely feel it even. You have to really... Yeah. You have to really try and tap into it. Same as we see, we look at these wires, we know there is electricity going on there, yeah. but we don't see it. Yeah. So we yeah. need a, some sort of a molecule that would sense a voltage and convert it into the light. A molecule? It's a molecule, yes. It's okay. a protein, it's a protein nature, it's a protein uh, that can sense voltage across the plasma membrane, convert the chromophore in a way that it's going to be fluorescent. So every time neuron spikes, we see the increase of uh, the, the light flash in, on the uh, chip of our camera. Yeah. And then did you do that in vivo first? Uh, so we didn't have this molecule. Mm -hmm. It was just imagination. Imagination at first, yeah, yeah. Although we knew some of the uh, possible molecular mechanisms, how to convert voltage into the light, we didn't have a molecule that would work very well in the neurons. 
and, uh, and we didn't know how to make it. And what we decided to, to do, we decided how about we just create very, very large library, very diverse library of different, different genes using a special, uh, one special unique molecule, archaeorhodopsin. Archaeorhodopsin 3, it's, uh, also was, this molecule was discovered by it first time. Uh, we mutate it and we'll try to screen it and see if any of the mutants from this molecule can sense voltage inside of the cells. A uh, library was up to 10 millions, up 10 millions individual clones. Screening of each cell manually takes several so minutes. So it means I wouldn't be able to finish probably the screening of this library till nowadays if I start doing it manually. Mm -hmm. And Ed uh, was saying, oh, how about we just make robot to do it for us? Mm -hmm. And uh, this is how we end up designing a special robot that uh, can s image very large population of the cells mm -hmm. automatically, pick the best cells expressing the voltage sensing molecule, mm -hmm. uh, and select it using a micro pipette, and everything in a, in automated mode, in fully automated mode. I remember this this day when I s click start. It took me about two years to make it to happen. Mm -hmm. But once it's, everything was set, we click start button. Robot did it for us for two hours while I was drinking coffee. At the end of this process, I take the tube with a few cells selected from the plate. I clone the genes and one of them was the, the Archon uh, voltage sensor that we're currently using for voltage imaging in vivo. Whoa. Two years to set it up and then two hours to find it with, with the robot. <laughs> but okay, two and plus two hours to clone it, yeah. Whoa. Okay, so I'm, as a, as a, you know, an advanced monkey, I'm trying to understand uh, this. Yeah. And okay, so there's, you, re you really, you want to be able to have a way to sense the voltage, yeah. Okay, and the the the, the modulation. You want to be able to sense the modulation with, with these voltage sensors that can sense um, at very very small amounts of voltage. Correct. Okay, and then you also need the robotic assistance to be able to see that that action. Uh, so, uh, robotic assistance. We need to develop this molecule. To develop, so uh, we back when we knew that archaeorhodopsin was uh, uh, dimly fluorescent, and it, its fluorescence was modulated by voltage. It was done by Adam Cohen, and I think we published this work in 2011. However, this molecule had many disadvantages and didn't work in neurons. We wanted to make it in, to work in neurons. And uh, we use this evolution. It's same method that nature using. What nature does, it's creating genetic diversity when applying selective pressure, see who survived, parents survived, we give a next breed and the process uh, repeats again, multiple iteration. So we do something similar in, in the tube and much, much faster. Uh, we took the molecule, this archaeorhodopsin molecule, it didn't work in neurons, it wasn't very bright, didn't localize to the membrane, but it was voltage sensitive and it was fluorescent. And what mm -hmm. we were able to do, we were able to enhance all these properties by mutating, randomly mutating some positions. Okay. And, but in order to, after we mutate, in order to understand what mutant out of these 10 millions yes. unique mutants are the right one, yes. we need a robot Yes. would do it for us. Uh, yes. Automatically. And the mutants did what? So mutants uh, were expressed in mammalian cells mm -hmm. and we were able to assess the localization. So we, so first property that we assessed it uh, to make sure that uh, protein is localized to the membrane because the electric field in a cell only exists across of the membrane. Mm -hmm. Once you want more than one nanometer away from the membrane, there is no more no electric more. field. It's yeah. a Debye radius. It's, yes, it's yes. Uh, decaying very, very quick. 
So first we need to make sure the uh, molecules are not on the membrane expressed well. Second, we want to make sure that uh, molecule shows sufficient level of fluorescence in order for us to image. And third, we need to confirm that during the changes, during the modulation of voltage across the plasma membrane, it changed the fluorescence. So we had to optimize three properties in uh, for 10,000 or 10 million of uh, independent uh, independent clones. And the ones that were the successful mutants were the ones again that did. Yes, we can repeat it several times. And Actually, we did it twice. Yes. Okay, and that those those successful mutants that you took and that could repeat, w they did what again? They were able to. Sense the voltage. We were localizing to the membrane, sense the voltage, and were bright enough for us to image it using optical, using a fluorescent microscope. Okay, so we let's just were making it better and better and better. Yeah, so break it down one more time. It could go past the membrane. The the. Yes. yes. So it can uh, get e uh, incorporated into the membrane. Okay because only uh, voltage exists across the membrane. Yes, okay. Second, it possesses some fluorescence. Yes. So we can image. And third, okay. the fluorescence depends on the voltage across the plasma membrane. The higher the voltage, the higher fluorescence. Okay, okay, okay. Just barely understanding, <laughs> it just barely, tiny bit I, of understanding. I can tell you uh, what, uh, how it looks like under a microscope you see the neuron with blinking. Yeah. You shine the certain light and you image the fluorescence and it's blinking. Yeah. And we know that each blink corresponds to action potential. Yes. This is the main idea. Yeah. But to make this molecule, we you, need to, to do, do the 10 million mutations and try and find the neurons that could through when you do optogenetics, it will show its action potential. Uh, yes. Okay. Yeah. Still <laughs> child understanding i love yeah. it i love yeah, it it's because it takes years of really yeah. diving in to to be able to 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 get it but okay so then the um uh now teach us about what with that technology what can you do with that uh in um uh, we can read minds how <laughs> yes <laughs> this is a big goal, very, very big, far. This is the big goal. This yeah. is very, very far. Yeah. So uh, with this technology, we were able to image uh, the activity of the neurons in behaving animals with a single cell, single spike precision. So uh, in, uh, we believe that every neuron is important. So there are several classical papers showing that even driving of one neuron in the brain can change the status of an uh, animal. It can get, go from aggression to fear. The butterfly by, effect. By, by changing just activity of one of neuron. One I think neuron. it was uh, yeah, a classical paper in, published in Nature, yes. So it means every neuron in our brain can be very, very important. Mm -hmm. In order to understand the brain, it means that in order to understand the brain, we need to image, uh, we need to understand how every cell spikes and how they connected to each other. So you can take the mutated neuron that can be that can be stimulated and read up to genetically that you can then take that and potentially implant that neuron. Uh, what we do we uh, we inject viruses into a mouse brain. You inject a virus Adenos, uh, recombinant adeno associated viruses. Yes. These viruses get inside of the neurons and yes. make these neurons express our molecules, channel rhodopsin and uh, voltage sensor. And now oh this enables <laughs> to both drive and see these neurons. So we were able both activate the neuron activity you and see could. it. could, you did both. So then yes. you read what the mouse what the neural activity so of the mouse. what we did next we put animal on a ball and uh, so no first we injected the uh, virus virus to express our voltage sensor in neurons then we put a small window on a skull 
to gain an optical access to the neurons, we put this animal under a microscope, mm -hmm. image the neurons. It was actually in subcortical brain region called uh, stratum. It's a region responsible for uh, it, it's many functions, but one most prominent is locomotion. So we gain an optical access to stratum. We saw the cells expressing voltage sensor. We make animal run on a ball. And while it's running on the ball, we record the speed at what animal was running. It was voluntary, uh, voluntary motion. And the image when you runs with a single spike precision. After the imaging was done, we correlated the speed to the activity of the neurons. And we were able to find that 30% of the cells spike faster when the animal is moving. Mm. And about 10% of the cells was sp spiking slower when the animal wasn't moving. It gives us an ability when in future, for example, we image only neurons and we don't know what animal is doing based on patterns of neuron activity, we can say animal was sitting or running. Yeah. So this is kind of why I a think starting Brian, point. Yes. Uh, reading minds. Okay. Okay. So then, just from so. neural activity, you could tell if an animal is running or sitting. Yeah. yeah. Uh, okay. In in principle, yeah. In principle. So this okay. is what uh, people right now uh, trying to do in neuroscience. We are obtaining very big, uh, very large data sets. Uh, one of them uh, people are doing for zebrafish. When we observing zebrafish, recording activity of zebrafish during swimming. And then using this data, if, we, if you have input activity of the neurons, you can tell. Was animal, or was zebrafish swimming or not swimming or doing something else? Yeah. And you can determine that with a very high degree of accuracy, if it's swimming or not yes. swimming. And probably even predict the speed and direction. Oh, oh that's cool too. The it's a next level. This next is what level. people. Yeah. So, but I would say it's, uh, to a certain extent, it's kind of reading mind. Yeah. So it's, it's kind of. Yeah. yeah. But uh, of course, we uh, we don't use it for the reading mind. We're trying to use it to understand how the brain works. How the brain works, because how do you, when can you tell from neural activity if I see the color red or blue? Can you determine from neural activity if I'm happy or sad? So that type yes, of stuff. Yes, absolutely. So yes. then this is where we want to potentially. Take. Yes. So the only one problem uh, in uh, I, so in a mouse brain, it's how many? Ten millions or 100 millions of neurons, mm -hmm. we were able to image only 30, up to 30. <laughs> so you can understand the scale. But 30 neurons were able to, we were able to tell if it's running or if it's yes. stopped. Yes, so we were able on this uh, scale already, because it's something very, uh, uh, so, uh, many neurons involved in the same, uh, but activity. here's a question. Yeah. If I was wearing an EEG and mm -hmm. I was, you know, either running on a treadmill or walking on a treadmill. Or imagining that you're running. Or imagining that I'm running on a treadmill. Could you tell the difference in the neural for activity? E, for EEG, I don't, I'm, I don't know. Probably from EEG, yes. Uh, because of the oscillation that we have, uh. neuronal oscillation, yes, we can, uh, yeah. we can say. But... Uh, neuronal activity with a single cell and single spike precision uh, gives much, much better uh, yes. predictive, yeah, because you can run and doing something else and EEG may not be able to recognize oh, sure, this kind sure. of thing. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So we would like to do complete understanding, everything, everything. Very often we cannot track some very small details of animal is doing. So in running is very, uh, it's a something major going on with animal. Lots of neurons involved into this locomotion. So that's why we were able. To. And actually, that's why we select this task because we knew it's, this is something that we will be able to find. People knew about this kind of effect, but we were able to show it using optical imaging. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so, the, so I'm also curious how long the. By Im by using the virus for the implanting the voltage sensors, mm -hmm. uh, how long did the m mice live afterwards? We were able to image animals up to half a year. Interesting, six months. Half a year, about yeah, six months. Every few weeks, we were able to image. Mm -hmm. Yeah, our best animals, uh, yeah, survive for. Yeah. Yeah. We had actually we had to perfuse them. I think we could even image them longer. We had to perfuse them. 
to show the histology for the paper. This was the end point. <laughs> Because uh, reviewers ask us, oh, can you please show us uh, histology so we really know what are we imaging? <laughs> yeah. And so then, would there be a negative uh, consequence potentially if we were to implant ourselves with the virus? So this is what uh, mm -hmm. we still need to understand, but uh, AV is one of the safest viruses, with known safest viruses. I think... Uh, but the voltage sensors... This is another this thing. Is we, this is something which we need to study more and assess more. Because uh, you said those molecules get into the neurons yeah, themselves. Membrane. The yeah. membrane. Yeah. So, but on a positive note, on a positive note, uh, I think two years ago, or a year ago, FDA approved uh, gene therapy based on uh, opsins for eyes, for blindness. I think it's about several hundred thousand dollar injection into the eye that, is, uh, that carry AV that encodes for uh, opsins. So people can restore some vision. I don't know how many people use it, but it, this is something that was approved by FDA. And I didn't think 10 years ago, I couldn't even imagine it would be possible. So we don't know what's going to be in another 10 years and h how we can advance our, our knowledge and our technology in 10 more years. Kiro, where would the technology that you've been teaching us, where would this take us translationally in the next couple of decades if we were to be able to unlock this? So my biggest scope right now that uh, this technology may allow us to perform new type of experiments that were not possible before to find better understanding of uh, most of the neurological disease we are going through. So it's very interesting. If you look, if we, uh, look back on humankind, uh, and we'll, 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 one of the most dramatic change what's happened is uh, lifespan of humans increased almost twice in the past century, right? We were living about 40 years, now we are going up to 80 years. Uh, and uh, what we discovered that the longer we live, the more diseases we're getting, different types of diseases. And one of the uh, uh, bad diseases that's happening to us, it's a, a neurological disease. Especially after age 60, the probability increases very, very quick. And maybe we are getting a little bit longer lifespan, but not always quality of life yeah, yeah. improving so fast. And I made my biggest goal, and this is what I would like to see happening using my technology, but we will be able to understand the underlying mechanisms for the neurological disease what we are getting right now. And uh, using this knowledge, try to solve how we can treat them. Because right now there is no, basically there is no any treatment for uh, neuro disorders. And if there are some, they work only partially with lots of, lots of uh, side effects. And how would your technology enable us to tackle the neurological so disorders? We, uh, one of the interesting, uh, uh, think that we brainstorming a lot and I think we are we are working a little bit right now uh, in 2016 uh, Li Hei Tsai uh, discovered uh, we, we published paper in Nature in 2016 that if we uh, flicker 40 hertz light into Alzheimer mice for several days one hour per day we have amyloid plaque clearing it just magically amyloid plaque. Clearing. Just yeah, they, they saw a reduction up to 50%, 40 to 50%. And uh, very often uh, amyloid plaques associated with Alzheimer's disease. And it's just flashing as in the, the, the we're 40 hertz. forced to look at. Uh, yeah, so animals are in the cage and there are LEDs that uh, is flickering at 40 hertz. For, a, for an hour per day. For an hour per day. Yeah. I wonder if that translates to humans. 
How, are, do we, are we doing any trials yeah, with neurological I, disease? Yeah, so I think uh, we got the permission to, to do it on humans right now. So in a recent paper published in Cell, we even uh, went a little bit further and we showed it's not only amyloid plaques clearing, but also there is a res restoration of some cognitive abilities. This is what more important. Which cognitive abilities were restored? So I think it ma majorly it's memory. Memory. So animal, I think animals were doing better in a maze. So when we have to get uh, to, to find the exit from a maze. Yes. And uh, animals with the treatment were able to figure out it faster yeah. because we remember it. I, we remember it's better. Yeah. And, uh, but nobody understands why and how it's happening. Nobody knows. There is a treatment and it's like a very big black box. Nobody knows why it's happening. And uh, what's wh our best guess? So I, I don't know. And there is some sort of synchronization. What I believe and what I saw yes. from uh, some preliminary that I think there is some synchronization of the cells and this synchronization of the cells activate certain mechanisms in the brain that uh, probably activate glia, microglia to come and uh, clean up uh, beta amyloid plaques. Clearing up of beta amyloid plaques uh, can restore the better connection between neurons. Glia is doing the amyloid plaque uh, cleanup. Clearing, up. yeah. Some, uh, Interesting. Yeah. Glial mm -hmm. cells are doing the cleanup. This is what we think, we yes. We think. This is what, and I, I think this is the case. Uh, some studies were showing, in vivo studies, yeah. even showing it in real time. And, yeah. the, and then the uh, clearing of the amyloid plaque enables the, uh, the circuitry to continue its original m way of retaining really good connectivity and yeah. memory yeah. restorations. This is, this is what I, this we is how hypothesize. I think, yeah, yeah okay. this is what I think, yeah. Okay, cool. Okay, so then that's one of the awesome and uses. Yes, and I, I believe that if we will be able to see how the neurons synchronized and uh, how the activity, uh, the correlation of the activity, for example, during Fourier horse flickering and without Fourier horse flickering, the Alzheimer models of mouse, we will get a better idea how it works on a functional, on a single, mo on a single cell level. And we'll get some clues on uh, how we can induce it, how we make it stronger. Or maybe it's too much of flickering is gonna be also bad, something. Yeah, so this is where my biggest call ca ca coming from for, for this technology. So our major goal right now is to spread this technology to neuroscience community and allow everybody to use it to answer the biological questions. Alzheimer is, a, is a just one example. There are also Parkinson, yes, yes. epilepsy, and so on and so totally. forth. Yeah. Yes, which are tens of millions of people around the world. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay, and then how does the, you know, that was on an optogenetics um, level of using that technology, but what about the optical voltage sensors uh, mm -hmm. applied? Do they apply in the same, uh, how do you, your, how does your virus? Yes, uh, yeah, it's yeah. same. It's a very similar molecules. Uh, actually, the voltage sensor that uh, we uh, using right now was made out of optogenetic tools. We we made them to work in the reverse. So the sensor that we found was built on optogenetic tools. Yes. We shine the line, it changed the voltage, but we make it to work in the reverse. Voltage changes and it shines the light. Voltage changes and then you shine the light. Yes, and it means okay. that uh, same principle on how to deliver and how to use it in vivo, same as for the genetic tools, yes. Okay, okay, because Li Hue Sai's work is without the Yes, it was non-invasive, absolutely. It no was virus, non -invasive. yeah, yeah, no virus. We were uh, flickering through the eye, yes. non-invasive. But and, uh, your virus, and optical yeah, so voltage sensor. Yeah, what we would like to do, we would like, using voltage sensor, we would like to see what's going on in the brain when we're flickering. Yeah, yeah. Gotcha. What's going on in the so brain. So now you want to add your optical voltage sensors to those experiments. We want to combine it. Combine yeah. it and then see what happens in those action potentials of the specific let's say 30 neurons again that you want. For example. For, for example. Although we, I believe we're gonna push it to 300 
or we are, we are working to push it to like huge. on the order of magnitude higher. Yes, yes. But yes. We and then what would you hypothesize that you see? Uh, my impression from very preliminary results that I saw, I think we will get a uh, synchronization of the cells. And most likely this uh, synchronization of a sub-threshold level mm. and probably some uh, higher uh, correlation or, or coherence of uh, uh, single spikes. This is what I think we, we're going to see. But we need to, this is just my Coherence hypothesis. and synchronization yeah, so of single spikes. So we will yeah. get uh, sub-threshold oscillation will get more coherent and okay. single spike will will happen uh, at the same timing for multiple neurons. Same time. timing for multiple neurons, okay. Yeah. Interesting. Wow. And then that could be one of the remedies for neurological disorders is yeah, 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 yeah. For example, you want to see, yes, how fast and why it's happening and uh, what kind of other m other mechanisms triggered by the synchronization. Yeah. 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 Our our brain is very synchronized, you know, there are many, many yeah. uh, brain waves, so-called brain waves yes. from alpha to gamma. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. at every uh, brain state, um, characterized by different frequency. When we sleep, it's one frequency. When we yeah. think, it's a different f frequency. When we walk, and so on and so forth. So synchronization, ensemble synchronization is of uh, neurons is pretty important for, for well, brain activity. Because it's potentially that the, that the optogenetics of that, of that light that is being shined um, to clear up the amyloid plaque buildup could be uh, a synchronization of a specific one of these, maybe an alpha or a... It's actually gamma. It's a gamma. It's, it's a gamma. gamma. It's yeah, because it's 40, 40 hertz, hertz band is band gamma. It's a gamma. Interesting. So then we know that it's uh, potential. That's the hypothesis that mm -hmm. it's a gamma um, synchronization that causes the um, the cleanup of the amyloid plaque. Yeah. And, the, and kind of the, in a sense, it's the restoration to homeostasis um, from a deteriorated state back. Probably. Potentially. Yes. Yeah. yeah. It's very exciting. The work is mind blowing. I, I love it. Yeah. So this is my biggest scope. And that's, I would like to spread the tool. And uh, I would be very happy if uh, this molecule, my technologies, the technologies I'm developing, will help in any of these biological questions. Yeah, and so the, the optical voltage sensors help us be able to measure things like that synchronization. Correct. The, the yes. gamma. Yes. Okay. Uh, this be is what we showed in, in 30 to potentially up to hopefully 300 neurons soon versus at an EEG at a, at a, at a, Correct. a yes. you can't actually get down to a single neuron level. Yeah. yeah and it's, yeah. it's we're getting uh, qualitatively different information from from EEG and from voltage sensors. Sensor and, sensor. and because those voltage sensors have the fluorescent protein, you can view that the action potentials. We can even happening. tell in a dendrite from what dendrite it comes to a soma. What? We can resolve especially from which dendrite? Even we come, we can see it's where it comes from. Yes, where it comes from. Because imaging happening on uh, kilohertz frequencies, kilohertz frequencies. And uh, yeah, e e if we can even say, see how it's originating in the dendrites, propagate to a soma, gets it uh, action potential, yeah. So people before were able to do this kind of experiments only in uh, culture, primary culture cells. And this is not relevant because culture cells, we don't do anything. We're not connected to a function, to behavioral. And when we can connect it with the behavioral in view of this is where with the fun stuff starts. Oh my gosh, yeah. Okay, so then what does it, to, co to co okay, so then that's back to the whole running versus walking. Mm -hmm. Okay, or potentially the happy or sad. Okay, okay. It seems like if we were in a gamma synchrony that it would be a state of, 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 so, of really 
Uh, Bli- of, bl- of bliss or transcendence uh, or something? No, no? So not what, necessarily. <laughs> so okay. usually when we focused, when we think, yes. this is where we, we see gamma, gamma band. And, but that's like really deep flow states, right? Yeah. So and also okay. uh, we, we have multiple different brain regions and different brain region uh, prefer different bands at different time, yes. Okay, okay. This is another thing, yeah. Yeah, so it can be a mixture of multiple, it can be alpha over beta on uh, gamma. Yeah, but what we say, we, s- we also talk about power of each band in uh, oscillation. Okay, so more, yeah, more for another time because Absolutely. yeah, there's Absolutely. so much to still unpack yeah. about what you're doing. It's also crazy that you are, you know, you want to take these tools and you want to spread them around the world and we want to get them in the hands of, you know, 12, 16, 18, 19 year olds, get them in the hands of young people to be able to go with their own creative thinking and, and build. Uh, yeah. But at the same time, you're leaving the Cambridge area and you're planning to go to Westlake University in China on a tenure track to be an assistant professor in the School of Life Sciences in Hangzhou. Yeah, yeah. so uh, I decided to accept an offer from uh, Westlake University uh, starting sometimes later this year uh, because it's given me a great opportunity to pursue my dreams on my own. I, th- I feel I'm very grateful to Ed for this six years with him where I mature as a scientist now I feel much more confident going and doing my science uh, the science on my own and uh, I, I decided to accept the offer uh, because it gives me a great opportunity to pursue these dreams uh, in, in science because we, we basically giving me freedom you do whatever you want as long as it's impactful and this is my dream I want to do whatever I want Maybe tomorrow I will change my mind completely or do something else as long as it's impactful, yeah. So yeah, I will be moving to, to China shortly. It wasn't maybe always a very simple decision and choice for me, Yeah. but uh, I just wanna chase my dream. I wanna chase yeah. my dream. And there's no way to chase it near the other cluster <laughs> of people in Cambridge? Unfortunately, uh, I uh, couldn't get any uh, offers uh, for, or matching for offers from United, yeah, for, from, uh, United States. And I would like to stay in academia. Uh, so this is my dream. This is another thing that I would like to be in academia because I believe academia is a unique, again, unique place that give you a yeah. complete freedom of your creativity. Yes, yes. Yeah. This is when you can change whatever you're going to be doing in one day. Uh, I've been working in industry and it's very different philosophy in industry, very different totally. approach. And I can tell this is not something that fits me 100%. Yes, yes. Maybe there are different benefits where on the side of salaries and so on and so forth. But I, for me, it's more important to have this, uh, that I can, un- as we discussed in the beginning, can cover my potential in uh, this kind of creativity. I would, Creativity and curiosity. Yes, I would, it, with the resources, I would figure out how to keep you in the Cambridge <laughs> area. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah, because you are a very eloquent communicator and a great scientist, and so I think it's very important to keep you um, around and be able to help. Uh, so I people. think nowadays science is, and I, shou- and I think science should be very international. Uh, because when yes. I develop something, when I uh, create something, I would like it to be open to anybody, yes. to everybody anywhere. And, and no matter what you do, no matter where you live, and no matter how you think, I want it, if you want it, I want it to be freely uh, accessible to everyone. And s- the ideas and the uh, other like data, I want it to be totally open to public. Yeah, the open notebook science is a very important part of being able to push the edge of knowledge together as a society Mm -hmm. more freely and get the technologies down to the young people to be able to play with and use the tools um, rather than keeping it closed off um, for monetary. Yeah, because technology shapes our civilization. The faster we can apply this technology, the more people can use it, the better, I think, the more positive changes we can see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's so oh, it's tough because 
you know, it's like, a, you know, your, your wife is also Chinese, which yeah. makes this transition a little bit easier. Uh, yeah, I hope uh, I will get more support on this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, on this end. And it's a beautiful um, facility. We were looking at it a little yeah. bit before we started. And, and, uh, and it's good that you'll be in the School of Life Sciences. You'll be pursuing, you know, you'll be teaching other people around the world. You'll be learning about the Chinese culture more. Mm -hmm. um, and hopefully we can work on, as we say, being this bridge. You know, I can look at this very positively too. I can say it's a very good thing that you're going because now this one of the missions that I say is that I want to help be a bridge between the United States and China. I want to help really foster a bridge to that like open notebook science, that collaboration, because I think that if the United States and China work together, I think we can help make sure the rest of the world we don't have any we can mitigate the existential mm -hmm. risks if we work together so maybe we can do cool things like go out to Westlake potentially and it will be great and interview some we are of stronger the, when we are together that we're much stronger together and, and I believe there are many great people in uh, Westlake uh, who you would like to talk to definitely yeah correct yeah and that's such a beautiful part of the world um, yeah. just very close to Shanghai um, right there on Pacific ocean there's so much to explore so many brilliant people in china that are pushing the edge yeah i i i, I feel like a trip we've mentioned this so many times a trip to china to interview some of the world leading scientists would be so important to, to do so I, i'm really looking forward to that and also think about that on the channel being able to have a series of 30 interviews with not white you know, people, people from Asia, from China mm -hmm. specifically. It's very important because then we understand that it doesn't matter if it's black, white, purple, brown, doesn't matter. I believe when we working together in a very diverse community, this is when the most powerful things are happening. I think our uh, creativity, the synergy of this creativity when the diverse group is from different backgrounds working together. Yeah. Yeah, because then you realize what someone from a from the Eastern civilizations is thinking about what a Western organization is trying to do, and you get maybe they can actually better the idea. Maybe someone from the West can better one of the ideas from the East. So there's ways to like collaborate on this. Maybe someone mm -hmm. fresh from a philosophy in Africa or from Latin America can come in and give you some profound insight into your academia or your industry or your governmental structures. And so I, I completely agree that it's a very beautiful thing to be able to work that way. But also a meritocracy at the same time. It's, a, it's an interesting conversational point. Okay, just to wrap a couple quick things. Mm -hmm. um, this was, I found very interesting. We've now interviewed, I believe, you know, Aubrey de Grey, um, Robert Ajemian. Um, there's a couple other people um, that don't have cell phones. All right. Yeah, so I, we've, we now know a decent amount of scientists um, that choose to not have cell phones because they believe it's destroyer of of personal solitude, of focus. Uh, so what is the reason why you choose to not have a cell phone? So for me, first of all, it's a distraction. Distraction. If I have a cell phone, it can be distraction when it's ringing. Or if it's in my pocket, I will be sometimes unintentionally, for example, pulling it and staring at it for no reason. So uh, my observation, and it's also some sort of a protest, to, to what I see outside. So when I take in a train, what I do on a train, I count people on a train who are using cell phones versus who are not using cell phones. And tell us the numbers. So 80% in Cambridge on a red line, I'm taking the red line most of the time using a cell phone. But what do you do? We, we staring at it like this. Yeah. And uh, I, I feel sometimes this is a crazy number. This is a very big number. And I, I am afraid one day, People will wear goggles yeah. all the time and we're not going to see people around. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I think cell phones, they are useful, but they also destroying some of our, like, what, who we really are. Because communication, I prefer communication in person. Me too. I prefer communication in person. This is, I think, it's very different experience. So this is another thing. When I don't have a cell phone and people want to talk to me, they will come and talk to me in person. So promoting this uh, communication in person. So, 
And on a relevant note observation, for example, I've been in, in uh, Tokyo just recently taking train in Tokyo. Uh, and I also was counting people using a cell phone wear. And uh, it was less, no more than 10% on the Tokyo subway oh, system. Only so 10% versus 80%. Yeah. yeah, Japanese, for some reason, this is my observation, we don't, we, uh, we don't use cell phone on a train and we don't talk on a cell phone on a train. Uh, and uh, then uh, I, a few weeks later, I was in China. In China, it's a very different situation. Uh, without cell phone, you won't be able to do anything. There is a street food. Uh, I believe people selling a food that they just cook at home a couple of minutes ago. You won't be able to buy a food uh, on the street. Because it's Alipay or we. Yeah, uh, so you, yeah. <laughs> you, yeah, you, yeah. S you scan a QR code and we give you a food. Nobody use cash. When I pull yeah. out the cash, everybody will look at me. What is it? What is cash? this? Cash, weird. Yes. Yeah. That uh, you're just scanning your QR. QR your, code, your you're taking taxi, you, you're paying in a, in a store, you're paying in the restaurant with a, uh, with a phone. So it's the, the phone in China integrated in daily life much more than here. And this is another my fear. Okay, I will have to use a cell phone if I go there because I won't be able to survive her. This is, I will, I will be pushed to an extreme and uh, without cell phone, I won't be able to function well. Or. You could do something like only download the payment so, yeah. and then yeah. only take it with you when you leave the campus. Yeah. So that, like yeah, because then if you're spending your time on the campus, yeah. I know, wow, so it's almost as though we're some of the civilization, uh, is forcing you to have the device in order to interact with people yes they uh, and uh, i also and I, what i when i it, maybe it's not very good but i also try to see what people doing on their uh, cell phones during when they're taking train or something oh yeah i do too when <laughs> I, I i was when we were in the um uh there was a in the venetian plaza and mm -hmm. there was a big uh, musical yeah. group playing young girls on their phones and the instrumentalists right in front of them but they're right there on their phones and I look and they're you know doing that g some game where they're yeah. you know and just about 50% of the people playing game from my observation 50% just 50 playing percent games playing uh, puzzles or some sort of games when you have to do something yes on the yes phone. yes this is my observation some uh, cases when people just sliding <laughs> screams back and forth. So and I'm when I'm looking, I I'm afraid. Well, okay, I'm afraid that I will be doing if I have a phone, I will be doing something similar, and I think it's very bad. Uh, this way, this is another way. <laughs> and you have people like me that see what you see, and then I just went and deleted all of my social media apps. Oh, yeah. I turned off all of my notifications. My phone is always on silent. So it's just uh, just call, email, text, and like maps and Uber yeah. and stuff like that, right? Mm -hmm. and Something practical. But even the practicality, even that, the notifications are off. The phone is always on silent. Mm -hmm. So I have to go with my own instinct to go and open the messages, to go look. But not me getting sucked in to, to go. Yeah. yeah, so this is uh, one of, uh, I think, uh, uh, two years ago, International Health Organization classified uh, game dependence, uh, dependence on from video games as a disorder. They put it in a, in a list of uh, official disorders. And they also think that uh, uh, when people check in phones very often, very often. 150 times a day, yeah. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah so yeah. this is also, they think, this is already out of a normal uh, range. and. I'm afraid that it might affect me in a bad way as it well. Just, it, it, there's no way it wouldn't. Yeah. yeah, so it will. It's just up to you to take control of it instead of yeah. it controlling you. So yeah, this is a very interesting conversational point that you and I could continue riffing on, but mm -hmm. even just having your perspective on why you don't have one is, is so, so critical, right? It's, you're fighting against, in so many ways, the cultural norm. I love that, I do it too. Okay, couple quick things on the way out. Okay. What is one skill 
that you think that young people and even adults should know moving into the exponential technology age? Uh, into exponential technology age? Oh, this is a tough question. One skill. I think it doesn't, m so uh, my, my perspective on the thing, it doesn't matter how smart we are, doesn't matter how cool and how advanced technologically we are. I think, first of all, we should stay kind to each other. Yeah. Doesn't matter how smart you are, if you're not kind, nobody's gonna deal with you. I think people should still remember about moral standards, be nice to each other, and of course, love each other. Yeah. This is, I think, this is the most important thing. If we do this, all the rest we can figure out. Yeah. But sometimes this is much harder to figure out than any science, than any, uh, any technological challenge ever, unfortunately, yeah. yeah, yeah. And things like the ancient multi-thousand-year-old traditions of meditation and connectedness to you know, spiritual transcendence, they can help us with our ability to be kind and compassionate to one another. And yeah, yeah, this is, I'm afraid, maybe we, in our modern society we start losing these kind of things. And it might have to do with the, since the Industrial Revolution, the just everything having to be productive, efficient, capitalism, yeah. efficient, has to make money. And yeah. yeah, and that has made us, in a sense, it's made us more part of the economic machinery than it has made us spiritually enlightened. Yeah. Take it as further away from nature, yeah. And into the metropolises yeah. of do 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 and all of the monolithic buildings without atriums and without mm. plant gardens and rock walls and fun and animal therapy with the forest therapy, yeah. you know, together. Okay, and the last two questions is, are we in a simulation? Ah, so this is, uh, if we are in a simulation, there was, uh, uh, not very recently, I think, uh, uh, scientists from Israel published a work showing that if we in simulation, the computer power that needs to create this simulation requires more molecule and more atoms than currently are in the universe. So it means it should be universe with uh, several times bigger than current universe in order to do the simulations. They predict. They say, okay, uh, if mm -hmm. in simple terms, if there is one particle and we would like to predict its motion. We will need the computation power that would require at least three particles. You know, so, okay. And this is how we're showing, okay, probably we are not in a simulation. But uh, we are in a simulation in a way that uh, everything we see, feel, and do, this is, this is happening through our interaction uh, through the neurons, right? This is in our mind only. What we see, feel, and do, this is only in our mind. And our mind simulates this picture. So it's yes and no at the same time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes and no at the same time. Yeah, we've we've heard it, uh, a couple times that f that the experiences are right here inside of our skull, and then we create that. Mm -hmm. And on the other point, the rendering aspect is kind of interesting. That you are just rendering what you see and experience so that you are not rendering anything else except this room in MIT right now. Yeah. And then once you go out, then you start rendering the other things, which saves on that computational Absolutely. power side of things. So there's a couple ways to, yeah, to poke and prod at this scientifically mm -hmm. that I'm very interested in. Last question, what is the most beautiful thing in the world? Humans. I still believe humans. I still believe humans. Yeah. Because, and this is what we're studying. We're studying ourselves. Because we believe probably the most beautiful thing, like the, the, uh, after medieval resi Renaissance started. And Renaissance started because people start talking on themselves, start exploring themselves, uh, that was prohibited by church for so many centuries. And that's why we're studying the brain, one of the most beautiful parts of our body. Yeah, so probably with yeah, humans. Yeah, and there's currently 8 billion different 
Human. Everybody Human. unique, everybody special. Special and unique and have their own creative potential yeah. that can be flourished and a hundred billion before the eight billion that built yeah. the beautiful civilization that yeah. we have. Yeah. yeah. Wow, Kirill. Wow, wow, wow. This has been such a fascinating show. Thank yeah. you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for having me here. <laughs> it was such an honor. Yeah. It was such an honor. Yeah. And we learned a ton from this show. Optical yeah. voltage sensors, optogenetics, expansion microscopy, all of these new novel tools and methods for imaging and interfacing, mm -hmm. um, and just what's actually at the edge and how do we get that edge back down to the general population to mm -hmm. get using it. This has been super fascinating. Thanks everyone for tuning in. We greatly appreciate it. Go and share more conversations around neural imaging and interfacing with your friends, your family, your coworkers on social media. Start sharing and talking about these conversations more. Give us your thoughts in the comments below. Check out Curiel's links below as well in the bio. Also, support the artists, the entrepreneurs, the organizations around the world that you believe in. We had a part of our conversation was about the United States working together with China to so figure out who these people are across the seas that we can work with and collaborate with that are building really important platforms that bring us together and help us work together. So support them, support simulation. Our links are below as well. Support us so we can keep doing cool things like going to Westlake University and conducting some of these interviews. That would be fascinating. And go and build the future, everyone. Manifest your dreams into the world. Thank you so much for tuning in, and we will see you soon. Peace. Bye. <laughs> that was so good. You are awesome.